Hello everyone, this is Dr. Lennon, and we're going to be going over the test two review. So uh, the first problem, uh, first few actually involve just factoring. So uh, for this one, it's just repeated uh, use of the difference of squares factoring method. And remember the difference of squares uh, basically says that if you have the difference of two perfect squares, something of the form a squared minus b squared, this factors into uh, a plus b times a minus b. That can quickly be checked by just foiling out the right hand side. Your outside terms plus a b and your inside terms minus a b will cancel. So basically for this problem when we have 256 minus 16z to the fourth, notice that 256 is 16 squared and 4z to the fourth is 4z squared, quantity squared. So this can be broken down into 16 plus 4z squared times 16 minus 4z squared. And then the second set of parentheses, there's also a difference of squares. So that can be repeated one more time. So this ends up as 16 plus 4z squared. And the second set of parentheses is 4 squared minus 2z quantity squared. So this can be broken down into 4 plus 2z times 4 minus 2z. And that is that. So let's go ahead and move on to the next one. So for number two, we have a factoring a trinomial problem. Um, and again, the coefficient of x squared is not one. So for this problem, what we need to do is we need to first multiply the first coefficient by the last coefficient. So five times negative 15 comes out to negative 75. And then we need two numbers that multiply to negative 75, but add up to positive 22. So um, negative three and positive 25 will do the trick. Minus three times 25 is negative 75 and minus three plus 25 is positive 22. So then what we can do is we can essentially rewrite this as five X squared uh, minus three X plus 25 X minus 15. So we've rewritten 22 X as negative three X plus 25 X. And then we factor by grouping the first two terms and then grouping the second two terms. So from the first set of terms, you can take out an x and we're left with five x minus three. And from the second set of terms, we can take out a five. And again, we're left with five x minus three. So now that parenthetical quantity five x minus three is common to both the first term and the second term. So it can be factored out and we're left with x plus five times quantity five x minus three which gives us our full factorization. So that is the general way to factor a trinomial using, sometimes this is known as the AC method, because what you do is you're basically multiplying that five in front times that minus 15 to get the minus 75 quantity. And then once you find the two numbers that decompose it, you can split the trinomial into something with four terms and group each pair of terms. That leads to the final factorization. Okay, so now we can kind of take this to the next level, factoring with the zero product property that will allow us to um, solve equations. So uh, the zero product property, let's just review what that says. The zero product property just says if you have two things that multiply together that make zero, uh, then one of those things must be zero. That's the only way that you have numbers multiplying to zero. So if uh, a times b equals zero, then, well, I can even make a stronger statement. I can say if and only if. Uh, so a and b equals zero. Why don't we just say if and only if? If and only if. Either a equals zero or b equals zero. Or both even. Um, so what we want to do is we want to take this uh, 4x times x plus 1 equals 3, and we want to move all the numbers to one side and 0 to the other, and then that's how we can begin to use the zero product property. So if we multiply on the left, we get 4x squared plus 4x, and then uh, we can subtract the 3 on both sides. That will leave us with something that hopefully we can factor. So we have 4x squared plus 4x minus 3 equals 0. 
and then we can rely on the method we just did for the previous one, the trinomial factor by grouping. So we multiply four by negative three and we get negative 12. And then we're looking for two numbers that multiply to negative 12, but add up to positive four. So that's gonna be six and negative two. So that allows us to split that middle term. So we can now write this as four X squared plus six X minus two X minus three equals zero. And we can factor uh, from the first two terms, 4x squared and 6x have a common factor of 2x, and we're left with 2x plus 3. And then if we want to make that match what's in parentheses from the first group, we want to take out a minus 1. If we take out a minus 1 from the second group, we also get 2x plus 3, which allows us to finish up the factorization and write this as 2x minus 1 times 2x plus 3. And so that will leave us with the... Uh, full factorization, so we have both things in parentheses being multiplied and giving zero. So what that means is we can write down either 2x minus one equals zero or 2x plus three equals zero. That's from the zero product property. And what we can do is we can just solve each equation independently. So adding one, we end up with 2x equals one. And in the second equation, we'd have to subtract three. So we get two X equals minus three. And then we just want to divide by two on all parts. So we end up with our final solutions here. We have either X equals one half or X equals minus three halves. And that is it for this problem. So moving onward, problem number four is uh, similar to problem number three, where we want to um, use the zero product property and factoring to solve. So um, usually I like to keep my x squared coefficient positive. It's just a, a habit. So um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to move all of my terms to the left-hand side of the equation and uh, have zero on the right hand side so I'm going to subtract 4 and add 7x squared to both sides and then I'm going to list those in decreasing order in terms of degree so I'm going to write it as 7x squared plus 3x minus 4 equals 0 and now we can go ahead and proceed with the um, factor by grouping method. So we want to multiply the first coefficient seven by the last coefficient negative four. So we end up with negative 28. And we're looking for factors of negative 28 that add up to three. So those are actually just the numbers that we multiplied seven and negative four. So we can factor by grouping and we have seven X squared plus seven X minus four X minus four equals zero. And so the, uh, GCFs are fairly obvious here. The first group, we're going to factor out 7x, and from the second group, we're going to factor out negative 4. So we take out 7x, and we're left with x plus 1. From the second group, we can factor out minus 4, and we're also left with x plus 1. So uh, the full factorization is going to be 7x minus 4 times the quantity x plus 1 equals 0. And then we set each linear part to zero by the zero product property and just solve for x in the linear equations. So uh, uh, for the first equation, we'd add four and divide by seven. So we end up with x equals four over seven as one of the solutions. And for the second one, we just need to subtract one. So x equals negative one would be the solution. And that's it for the fourth problem. So identically the same to uh, number three. So I maybe skipped a few steps there, but that, that's all you really need to be able to do. Move everything to one side, expand if necessary, go ahead and use the factor by grouping method, and then decompose using the zero product property. So let's go ahead and move on to number five where we um, use the quadratic formula to solve a quadratic. Okay, so for this problem, we wanna use the quadratic formula. So we've got five X squared minus X minus three equals zero. So our coefficients here, A is five, B is the number with X, so that's negative one, and C is your constant term, negative three. So let's review the quadratic formula. So what did that say? Um, it was the general way to solve all quadratic equations. 
So it tells us the solutions to ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero are given by x equals minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac with everything being divided by 2a. So essentially we're just going to plug these values in. We've already identified what a, b, and c are. Do the arithmetic and then we can find out the approximations if we would need them. Otherwise you can leave the answer in exact form. It just kind of depends on uh, what the problem asks for or what use it is to you, I should say. Uh, so here we end up with x equals, uh, well, if b is negative one, negative b must be positive one, plus or minus the square root. Uh, so one place people go wrong, if b is a negative number, a lot of times they'll omit these parentheses, but you need to include them. So we need negative one in parentheses squared minus four times five times negative three, with everything being divided by two times five. So, here we have x equals one plus or minus the square root of, what do we have? We have one and 60, so 61 over 10. So this really splits into kind of two values. Um, so x equals one minus the square root of 61 over 10. This will be the smaller value. Or we have this other value down here, uh, x equals, 1 plus the square root of 61 over 10. Uh, and then you can approximate those both in your calculator. I'll go ahead and do it and just round them to two decimal places. So 1 minus the square root of 61 uh, over 10 comes out to minus 0.68 for rounding to two decimal places. And on bottom, uh, that would come out to 0.88. So those are the two values. And that's all you have to do for this one. So the quadratic formula, um, you know, I think maybe the intimidation factor for some students is just simplifying the arithmetic or maybe memorizing it, but really there's not a whole lot of um, critical thinking involved when utilizing it. You just need to identify your numbers, pay attention to your negative signs, and go step by step. Okay, so this next problem is just some introductory statistics stuff, finding uh, first quartile, median, and third quartile. So the first job is to sort the data. So let's rewrite the list. So scan and write from smallest to largest. We have four, um, and if it helps you, you know, you can cross it off or underline it. So after four, the next biggest one is 30. So 30, um, and then it looks like 51 is the next largest. Um, then from there, 54, 65, uh, 84, 90, and 92. So we have in total eight elements. So remember that there are kind of, <clears throat> so I'll go ahead and erase these marks so it's not on the final set of notes. Uh, so for the median, when there's an odd number of elements, you'll have exactly one in the middle. But when there's an even number, then you'll have two elements in the middle. So <clears throat> uh, what's going on here is we have just the uh, we have just the uh, two elements in the middle. So we have both 54 and 65. So let's start by figuring out the median. What the median will be is just the average of those two numbers. So 54 plus 65 over two, which should be 59.5. Um, so quartile one and quartile two, if there's an odd number, there's an inclusive or an exclusive method defining them. If there's just an even number like this, basically what happens is the uh, inclusive and the exclusive are gonna come out to be the same. Essentially the list is partitioned into two elements, <clears throat> kind of like list one and list two. And to find quartile one using this kind of like naive method, we just look for the median of list one. So list one, we have two 
middle elements. So this will be the average of 30 and 51, uh, which comes out to 35.5. Oh, no, sorry, uh, that would be 40.5. I thought they were 11 apart, but they're 21 apart. Um, so 40.5 and for Q3, what that's going to be is that's going to be the uh, average of the two middle elements of list two. So that's gonna be 84 plus 90 over two, which comes out to 87. So quartile one using this method is 40.5, quartile uh, the median is 59.5 and quartile three is 87. So, you know, using Excel, you'll see that there are two options an inclusive and exclusive method for calculating quartiles. And you can also do it by percentiles, but uh, for us, we're just gonna stick to this kind of naive method that's based on sorting the lists and then looking for the middle element. So for problem number seven, we're looking at a rational expression, basically a fraction. And we're asking, when is it less than or equal to zero? So to understand when a fraction is less than or equal to zero, we just need to know when is the top positive or negative and when is the bottom positive or negative. So Essentially, there's kind of two critical values that we can examine of all possible x values. We have negative 6, which would make the denominator 0, and we would have 2, which would make the numerator 0. Now, we want to include 0, so basically 2 is definitely going to be part of the solution set. However, negative 6 will not be part of the solution set because when the bottom of a fraction is 0, that fraction is undefined. It is not equal to 0, so a fraction is only equal to 0 if the top is equal to zero. So then what we want to do is we just want to kind of look at like the different regions. We have region one, region two, region three, and we want to say, okay, well, what's going on with this fraction? So in this fraction, if we look at some number less than negative six, say negative seven, and you plug that in for X, you would get a negative on top of your fraction and you would have a negative on the bottom of your fraction. A negative divided by a negative is always going to be a positive. You're looking for values where that fraction is negative. So basically that's not part of your solution set. Um, region two, you could plug in zero. Zero is between negative six and two. So if you have negative two on top and six on the bottom, you're gonna have a negative on top, a positive value on the bottom, and that's going to come out to a negative. A negative divided by a positive is negative. So that will be part of your solution set. And then the third region, um, if you plug in some value larger than two, say three for X, you would get three minus two, which would be a net positive on top. You would have a net positive on bottom with three plus six. So a positive divided by a positive comes out to a positive. So that would not be part of your solution set. So essentially all your values that you care about are between negative six and two. So your solution in interval notation would be uh, negative six with the parentheses and two with a square bracket. So that would be your solution set for problem number seven. For problem number eight, we're solving another inequality, but we're solving one that involves an absolute value. So again, remember absolute value is essentially saying uh, this quantity has to be a distance that far from zero. So if we're looking at 2x minus 6 greater than or equal to 18, we're saying that expression needs to be at least 18 units from 0. So the only way that can happen is it can be broken down into two cases. So 2x minus 6, well, if you were 18 away from 0, but to the left of 0 on the number line, that would be negative 18. So if this quantity were less than or equal to negative 18, it would be more than 18 units from 0. The other way you could do it is you could just be 18 away to the right, which would be 2x minus 6 greater than or equal to 18. So this one breaks down into these two separate cases, and then you just solve each inequality separately and go on to finish the problem. So on the left, we'll add 6. So we have 2x less than or equal to negative 12 divide by 2. So we have x less than or equal to negative six. And for the other one, again, same steps, but we're gonna have a uh, different solution set here. So we have two X greater than or equal to 24. Then we divide by two and we end up with X greater than or equal to 12. So we have some or statements here. These two inequalities comprise our solution set. Uh, if we looked at the picture, again, 
Uh, you might have negative six over here. This is not going to be drawn to scale. 12 here, say zero is somewhere in the middle. Well, less than or equal to negative six is this direction and greater than or equal to 12 is to the right. So when you do interval notation, you basically do each one separately, then connect them with a union operator. So we have negative infinity up to negative six, union 12 up to positive infinity. So that would be our solution set in interval notation. Again, when you have two disconnected intervals that are part of your solution set and you wanna write them down, you wanna connect those with a union operator. Okay, so the last two are just applications to right triangle trigonometry. So uh, we're solving for the missing parts of a right triangle. Uh, for these, there's basically six parts, uh, sides ABC and angles ABC. Uh, notice that the angles are given by the capital letters A, B, and C, and the sides are given by lowercase letters A, B, and C, and the angle opens to the side with the same letter. So angle A opens to side A. Uh, and so on and so forth. And for these right triangle C's 90 degrees. So for each of these problems, you're basically given three pieces of information. And so you have three missing parts. So what are we given here? Well, C is 90 degrees and we're given B is 50 degrees and little b is 12. So basically we need to solve for angle A. We need to solve for side A. And we need to solve for uh, side B. Uh, excuse me, side C. I don't know why I said B. So the easiest of those in this case where we're given one of the angles already is to just find the missing angle. So angle A is, so when you have a right triangle, the other two angles have to add up to 90. So angle A is just going to be 90 minus angle B, which is 50. So angle A is just 40 degrees. So that's one of our pieces of information. Angle A is 40 degrees. And then we want to use trigonometry to find the other missing parts. So let's say we want to find A, and let's say we want to use the sine of A. So the sine of A would be the sine of 40 degrees. And the sine, remember, is the opposite over the hypotenuse. So the opposite of A will be side A, the thing we're looking for. Um, oh, so sine is actually not a good choice here because... Uh, I just kind of went through the motions without thinking, but if we try to use sine, we're going to be using A and C, and those are two of the things that we want to know. So we cannot use the sine of 40 to solve for anything meaningful. What could we use? Well, we could use the cosine of 40 because uh, the known uh, B is known. So what is B? B is 12, and that will be adjacent to side A or angle A. So if you use the cosine for the adjacent over the hypotenuse, we're left with cosine of 40 degrees, which is A, is going to be the adjacent side B, which we know to be 12, divided by the hypotenuse C. So then you can cross multiply. So we get C times the cosine of 40 degrees equals 12. We can divide both sides by the cosine of 40. <clears throat> and we have solved for side C. So you can put that into your calculator and round it to decimal places, so 12. Again, you wanna make sure for this problem that your calculator is in degree mode and not in radian mode. So 12 divided by the cosine of 40 should come out to 15.66. So now we know the value of C, so we can replace that one. <clears throat> so this is 15.66 and our last job is to find so we've kind of got a few distinct parts here so let's go ahead and find a so how are we going to find a well uh we could use uh, there's no right way to do this you can use whatever trig function you want so long as you know at least one of the missing sides and you know the angle so if we want a uh Let's go ahead and use the tangent of A since we know the value of B. So the tangent of A, well, we know A is 40 degrees. And this will give us A, the opposite side, divided by B, which we know to be 12. So in this case, when we cross multiply 12 times the tangent of 40 degrees is the value for A. 
So we can get that approximation quickly by just multiplying in the calculator. So 12 times the tangent of 40 comes out to uh, 10.07 if we're rounding to two decimal places. So that gives us the last of our missing three uh, pieces of information that we were looking for. So for these triangle problems, typically uh, what's going on is you're given three things and you want to find three unknowns. Uh, but we're doing it in a geometric way with these trig ratios. All right, so one more of these trig problems, and then that is it for the test review. Okay, so this last one, same deal. Uh, we want to find the missing pieces of information, but this time the missing pieces of information are side B uh, and then angle A and angle B. So when you're not given one of the smaller angles, you're only given the 90 degree angle, you're going to have to use an inverse trig function at some point. So uh, in this case, when you're not given one of the angles, usually the thing that's easiest to solve for first is the missing side. So why is that the easiest? Well, in this case, we can actually use the Pythagorean theorem. So we know a squared, five squared, plus the unknown b squared should equal c squared, 13 squared. So this is by the Pythagorean theorem. Again, let's kind of partition this. So you don't have to write that down, but I'm just making note of it. <clears throat> so we have 25 plus b squared equals 169. Subtract 25 and we have b squared equals 144. So uh, b is going to be the square root of 144 since we're dealing with a triangle. We're only looking for the positive value. So b is equal to 12. So we have the missing side. So now we just need to find those angles. So really the trick is just finding one of the angles and then the third angle is just a complementary angle so it's not so bad. But let's go ahead and, I don't know, let's use the sine of A, let's say. So we don't know what A is, but the sine of A would be the ratio side A, which is 5, divided by the hypotenuse, which is also given, and is 13. So... To find A in a right triangle, we can use the inverse sine button. So basically, we're doing the inverse sine button on your calculator. And you want to make sure we're in degree mode to get our answer in degrees. And we can get an approximate value for this. So typically, your inverse sine button is a secondary function on your calculator. So you want to hit the second button and then your sine button. And then you could do 5 divided by 13, close parentheses, and get 22.62 degrees um, so that would be the uh, value of A. So A would be about 22.62 degrees. And then we could use the, uh, again, the complementary method because we know A and B have to add to 90. So B would just be 90 minus uh, 22.62 degrees, which would come out to, oh, 67.38, I believe. So that would be your value of B, 67.38 degrees, and those would be all the missing pieces of information. Um, so let me just double check that. I'm pretty sure I'm right though. 90 minus 22.62. Um, again, you don't have to necessarily use uh, the sine here. You could have used the cosine of A. If, the, if you had the cosine of A, then what would have happened? That would have been the adjacent side, which would have been B, which we just found to be 12 divided by 13. Or you could have even used the tangent of A, which would have been the opposite 5 divided by the adjacent 12. So the trig function just tells you the ratio of which of the sides you're using from that perspective. Um, let me see also, let's say if you're on, um, let's see if the Windows calculator, we could do the inverse trig function. So this is just the calculator. It comes with Windows 10. Um, notice there's a degree button here. You can change between degree, uh, radian, and gradient mode. Uh, so we're currently in degree. So we wanted to do the inverse sine of 5 over 13. So let's see if it allows us to do that. If I do second, that gives me the inverse functions as I talked about. So we could do the inverse sine of, well, okay. So I think you have to put the number in first. Uh, I don't use this thing very much. So let's clear. Let's do five divided by 13. And then let's say we wanna take the inverse sine of that, then we'll hit our second inverse sine. 
So now it's taking the inverse sine of that result. And if we hit equals, we get, uh, well, I want to clear everything. We're not getting what we expected, 22.62. Um, it's not, doesn't even make sense in radians either. So let's, let's clear all this out and let's try and start over and see if, uh, can I clear everything? Nothing in the memory. There's the history. Okay, so how does this work? Sorry, I haven't ever used this before. I, I use an old-fashioned calculator. Um, so divided by 13. Let's try, if I do second, let's do second sine inverse 5 over 13. Did we try that already? So it's doing 5 over 13 is this number. And then let's say we want to do second sine inverse of that five. Okay, there we go. So it's getting 25.13. Did I do something incorrect on my calculator? Let me check. Because um, I got 22.62. So second sine inverse of 5 over 13. No, 22.62. Hmm. So I, I don't know, I'm not so sure what's going on with this calculator here. Standard, doesn't have many functions. The scientific has this one. I wonder if the any of the other features, no, that's just. So somehow, I don't also understand what this little indice is. Let's go ahead and use the uh, Google calculator maybe. Uh, so let's open a new incognito window and let's say uh, let's just type in Google Calculator since I, I'm not an expert with the Windows calculator so again we want to be in degree mode not in radian mode um, how do you do inverse sine here um, I don't see it. oh there's an inverse button INV so if you do inverse then it gives the inverse option so let's clear that out let's do the inverse sign um, arc sign is the same as the inverse sign and then 5 divided by 13 and then close the parentheses okay now we're getting 22.62 which is what I expected so that's the same thing I got as when I used my calculator so if you use Google calculator it's a little bit more intuitive than the Windows calculator but um, if you have just a push button calculator, which I expect you do, I recommend just going ahead and using that one. I don't typically use calculators on the computer too much. Um, all right, so that's it for the test review. Please let me know if you have any questions. Uh, this is Dr. Lennon signing off.